Hashtag challenge accepted. Hashtag revival. Hashtag there shall be a performance. Hallelujah. So, just want to take time to really talk to a few Ezekiels in the building. Individuals who are used to God visiting them, whether through dreams, visions, through the word, what have you. But it's just something different about this season and his visitation. There's something absolutely different about this season and this visitation. It doesn't, it doesn't favor the past times. It's a little bit more intense. He's been requiring the same thing, but my heart is a little bit more attentive. Mm. But regardless of the season, can I just get somebody to go with me for a minute and just tell God I'm open and available? Open and available. So I got notes, but you just go walk with me for a minute. So Ezekiel was one of those prophets who was used to talking for God when it came to dealing with the sins of Israel. He was a prophet who could see the issues and the problems as God would reveal those things to him. And he would be ready to say, Thus saith the Lord to you. Thus saith the Lord to you. This particular time is a little different because Ezekiel is not in the place where he is just telling you about the water that's causing you to drown. He is actually put in a place where he has to save or savage the life of those bones. Yeah. Ezekiel is put in a place where he has to, like Jesus, recreate. Recreate mankind. Recreate from these dry, bleached bones what God intended for them to be. And he did it according to the word of the Lord. Yeah. So, Ezekiel reminds me of a reformer. And a reformer is an individual who is devoted to bring improvement to what is wrong, corrupt, or unsatisfactory. Reformers cause abandonment of wrong or evil ways of life and or conduct. They alter perceptives. Well. And they realign vision. They alter Perception and they realign vision. Reformers live or they leave an indelible imprint on their world, both local and national. But when you find a reformer, wherever you find a reformer, you find a person who is met with challenge. You, you, you will never, never, either, either you look back into history or you look at present day, no reformer is ever left without a challenge. Now, when we think about challenge, the first thing that we, 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 we kind of go to is the idea of, you know, the, the sickness in the body, and, you know, all these different things that happen. Um, but the word challenge actually means a call or a summons to engage in any context. It is a skill or strength. The word challenge means an objection or query as to the truth of something. Hmm. An objection or query as to the truth of something often with an implicit demand for proof. 
challenge disputes truth or validity of. So I was born this way, I am this way, this is how it's going to be. If you ever get in life and you're moving along and something confronts you, it's meant to confront what you deem your truth to be. So at the same time, while it disputes your truth, it also has the same power to invite you to become something. Hmm. You just don't meet a challenge. And then on the other side of that challenge, you don't conform to be something different than you were before you met the challenge. So a challenge can bring you or invite you into an order or it causes you to engage or experience something different. Come on, let's think about this story of, in Genesis where Jacob is wrestling with the angel. He met a challenge. He met a challenge. And if you know the word, by the time he got finished wrestling, he didn't have the same name. I know I'm coming around the bend with this, but I'm coming. So he met this challenge. And it was an angel that saw fit to change his personality. Saw fit to do something in him because even though Jacob was, you know, changed a little bit, he still has some serious issues. He's on his way to meet his brother Esau and he's still trying to plan a way to manipulate Esau. Y'all better read y'all word. I'm going to send over some gifts and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. It is an intent to manipulate. And so what God says, okay, you're about to go meet Esau to repent to him for the wrong that you did. So I'm about to confront you so that by the time you meet Esau, what Esau sees is truth and integrity. Reformers, challenge, challenge, challenge. Hmm. So let's just go to the word, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel is, is, is at a place where he is brought to a battle. He is brought to a place where he is seeing the brokenness of the people. He is brought to a place where he is seeing the discomfort of the people. Brought to a place where he is seeing the shame of the people. Brought to a place where he is seeing the lack of motivation and resilience in the people, in the people, in the people. And it's so obvious because when the word starts to describe what he saw, he said the bones were very dry, very dry, very dry. No life, no life, no life, missing life. And so what Ezekiel, what Ezekiel sees in this vision, to me is kind of a comparison to what we see, not just in the church, but in the world today. And in order to minister to situations of sort, it takes a whole lot of Holy Ghost. Yeah. I figured that word would come in handy before the night was over. Any good. It takes a whole lot of Holy Ghost in order to minister to something that is so far removed yes. Yes. from life. Yes. We are used to seeing something and saying, oh, yeah, oh, well, I see in the spirit that your leg was broke on last week. And I see in the spirit that your lights are about to be turned off. And I see in the spirit that you are depressed and 
You're not going to be, I see in the spirit that five months ago your husband walked out on you. I see in the spirit that your, your children are a hot mess. No, no, nobody sees in the spirit that God is able to mend and put those things back together again. And so God takes a regular man who is in the same experience as the rest of the children of Israel. He uses that man, takes him up in the direction of the spirit. And when he releases him in the spirit, he asks him one question. After all this that you have seen, can these bones live? This has a lot to do with what you know about God. I know we try to prepare the people for warfare and we educate them on the power of the enemy. It's good in its place. But when in this dispensation, it's more so about what you know about God, his power and his ability versus what you know about the enemy. We are so full of stuff. And none of this stuff is getting us from point A to point B. Struggling with the same cycles. Not being able to perceive that God is doing something in the midst of a, of a chaos. We, we are unable. Unable. Unable to rightly, rightly, rightly see the move of God in this day. We are unable, hallelujah, hallelujah, to discern the times and the seasons, hallelujah. We are unable and it's because we're so overwhelmed. So overwhelmed. So overwhelmed by the cares of this life. So overwhelmed by things that, 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 that come to, to the fiery dots is what James calls them. I'm just trying to find a, a practical way to say it, but we're so overwhelmed. And what the Lord is saying is, I, I, I need some individuals. I need some individuals that after you have gone through your own little test and trial, <clears throat> you've gone through your own sickness and your own disease. I need some people to look back, find yourself at a place where you can prophesy to someone else. Ezekiel was not just put there to just preach. But he was put there to prophesy. How dare? How dare we just preach? And we don't prophesy. How dare we just Get a little word together. But we don't prophesy. All right, that's it. Ezekiel is at a place now where after the Lord has asked him, can these bones live? That's the challenge. And Ezekiel says, well, Lord, you know. All right, Ezekiel, you accept the challenge? Let's go for it. So he says to Ezekiel, start prophesying. Hmm. Now, I'm not going to do this right now, but I want you guys to go back to Ezekiel 36 in your time and read what the Lord told Ezekiel he was going to do in the 37th chapter. All right. So he tells Ezekiel, prophesy. And when Ezekiel starts prophesying in the seventh verse, I'm sorry. He starts prophesying in the fifth verse. And he says to the bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you. I think I'm a little bit too far up. So let's, okay. Yeah. So when he starts to prophesy, maybe it's my version. When he starts to prophesy, the first thing that he prophesies to is the structure of the individual. The thing that is meant to hold you in place. He prophesies to what is meant to hold you in place because before anything can cover you, 
you have to be willing and able to stand up under what's about to come. So we want the Holy Ghost to do something in us. Right? All right. But there must be a structure there. A structure for him to, to be able to come into and upon. So Ezekiel starts prophesying to the bones. And while he's prophesying, the bones starts hearing the word of the Lord. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They don't, they don't hear the word of flesh. They don't hear the word. They respond to the word of the Lord. And while he is prophesying, bone comes to bone. Bone, bone, bone. Bone comes to bone. And see, when you think about the actuality of what Ezekiel was seeing, this is amazing to me. Because what he actually was seeing was individuals in the tribe of Israel who were scattered. So it's really not that he was looking at a skeletal system. He was really looking at people who were divided. Like, you know what, I don't like Terrell because he wear green shoes. And he was really looking at people that said, well, you shouldn't really follow Bishop Davis. Go on to Bishop Grant or go on to Bishop Ware. He was really looking at people who, who was just, you know, confused for real. Confused, confounded, unable, unable to hold themselves together, unable to sustain themselves. He is looking at people who get a word and lose the word. Looking at folk well. who are unable to maintain maintain consistency with God. Looking at people who say, for God I live and for God I die one day. <laughs> but let a trial hit them. Change the body. Ezekiel was looking at looking at these people. And while he's prophesying to them, he's saying, Y'all got to come together. Because what the Lord is about to do is bring us back to Jerusalem. He's gonna bring us back to our promise. But we can't get to the promise if we're divided. Can't get to the promise if you're divided. You better preach it, preach it. We are divided. Can't get to it. Can't get to it. Can't get to it. And God is just sitting there waiting for us. He's waiting for us. Waiting for us. And he's and, and, and Ezekiel prophesies the bones. Uh-huh. And so the skeletal system comes together. Yeah. But it looks funny. Well. It looks funny. Come on now. Why does it look funny? It looks funny because it needed some meat. It needed something that would give it some weight. Yeah. 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 Needed something that would give it a little bit weight, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit weight, huh? So when the trials of life come, yes. I'm not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Yeah. Oh, God of my life, God of my life. He's trying to get it, he needs to give it weight. So he prophesies to, 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 to the bones and he says, you know what? Sinews, come on this. Muscles, come on this. And come on it. Covering. Covering the skin and the skeletal system. Cover it. Cover it. And when he when he gets finished prophesying to that part, now y'all, I'm not going to go over there, but just think about Genesis 1. Uh -huh. Alright, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to be like Cindy Trim. I'm going to float that. Hey, 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 hey. So he prophesies to the bones. Go ahead. When he gets finished prophesying to the bones, he prophesies to the covering. Uh -huh. But they're standing there and they're still lifeless. Hmm. We have a form. Yeah, but we deny the power thereof. So they're standing there shouting, dancing, and praising God. But ain't no life. 
You look real good, but ain't no life. Uh-huh. Yeah. Speaking in tongues, but ain't no real life. Well. Oh, oh man. You got preach. Giving your offering and your tithes, but ain't no life. Oh, ain't no life. Ain't no life. But we need life, right? So the Lord says to Ezekiel, I can't take them to the promise. Looking like this. No, 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 no. Can't take them to the promise looking like this. So what I want you to do, Ezekiel, is prophesy to the wind. The wind, the wind, the wind. The wind. The wind. Now, I'm, you know what? Y'all know the rest of it. He says, prophesy to the wind. And he says, say to the winds, come from the four corners. The four corners. The four corners. Four corners. The four corners. See, four corners. If you think about it, you're getting a collective view of the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when I bring you into the promise, you need to be able to minister to people of all shapes, sizes, cultures. So I just don't want to win to come just from the church. I just don't want a win to come from convocation. I need a win to come from the world. I know this is a little out there. So he says, prophesy to the winds and command the winds to breathe on those that were slain. And he said, I prophesied as I was told to do it. And this lets you know Ezekiel's not used to this place because he describes what he was seeing as a rattling and a noise mm -hmm. that probably shook him, right? Mm -hmm. It shook him because he wasn't used to being in a place where he is now creating. Yes. Yes. Words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Yes. He's not used to being in a place where God is moving upon him to create something out of nothing, not used to it. And we as a church, we need God to create something out of nothing when he has given you the Holy Ghost. So he says, prophesy to those that are slain. And now I'm about to tell you what you were seeing the whole time. These are the people of God. And these are the same individuals that say to me all the time, my hope is lost. I'm dried up and I'm with it. But you let them know this one last thing and I'm taking my seat. I'm about to open your grave. Bring you up from your grave. And see, this was not just a, a regular grave. It wasn't an actual, you know, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. This was, I'm going to bring you from that horrible mindset that you've been hanging on to. This was, I'm about to, when I told you I was going to heal you and you didn't believe me, <laughs> I'm about to do it anyway. To bring you from that place that you've been holding on to. I don't know. I don't know why we feel like we need to hold on to certain things. But you know, Jesus is that. He said. He said, "Good God." He said, "Good God." When he he takes the time. He takes the time to minister to us in our low place. When we can't minister to ourselves, he takes the time to minister to us in our desperate state. When we are unable to find the word, find the word to bring life to us. And he says, you know what? I'm going to skip over everybody. Skipping over the preacher. I'm skipping over the elder and the evangelist. And I'm about to bring you up from your grave. From your grave. From your grave. A grave of despair. A grave of poverty. A grave of confusion. A grave of perversion. A grave of generational curses. A grave. A grave. But when you leave church and you go home, you 
depressed and wondering, how can I end this and do it right? <laughs> Agree! Yeah. A mental anguish. Yes. A grave of tradition. Tradition. Yeah. Tradition. Yeah. A grave. A grave that challenges. Woo! A grave that challenges you. But here's the thing. You didn't have the strength to overcome it. Thank you, Lord. So what was meant to work for your good destroyed you. But the Lord is saying, I'm opening up the grave. My God. Ezekiel was a revivalist, a reformer. He was an individual that understood the importance of following God, saying and speaking the unthinkable. Because he knew, if I put my trust in God, this situation won't look like this. You will be able to move and flow this Jesus generation in this next dispensation. You will be able to move and flow if you're willing to say what the Lord is saying. I don't care what you see. It's not the final thing. I don't care what you have seen. It's not the final. For what the Lord has in store for his people. It is greater than the things that hold you captive. It is greater than the things that have held you captive. And when you leave this place on today, just know, as the word says in the book of Proverbs, death and life lie in the power of the tongue. So I'm not going to walk past the situation anymore and believe what I see. I'm going to see something different. I'm going to say what thus said the Lord. Hallelujah. And even when I came, Mother of the words. I'll force myself. I'll force myself. Everyone stand to your feet.